Good afternoon. I'm so glad you could join us for this special edition of Theoretical Tea and Company, where I am spotlighting and highlighting individuals uh, who have been affected um, by crimes of other people and trauma, and really talking about how they endured, how they endured and how they continue to endure to make it through. This is a special edition of Theoretical Tea and Company. I'm your host, Dr. Janice Murray Collins. Welcome, let's get started. Coming up, a conversation with Mrs. Susan Bro, the mother of Heather Heyer. You haven't changed a bit. I've been watching all of your videos and and all of that all up until last night, and uh, to just try to get to know you a little bit better as much as I could. And Heather, and oh my goodness, the fire that you have inside of you! I remember the comments and the and the quotes that you did. You're so um, adamant and strong and purposeful. Uh, do you feel? <laughs> Got me in trouble a lot over the years, I can tell you. <laughs> Got Heather in trouble a lot too over the years. Um, yeah. First it's off, I want to ask you a qu question. Yeah. Uh, what are your sources for your information? Oh, I so just... some of that is way off. Okay. So you can correct me. Um, did you get the questions that I sent you last I time? I did. And that okay. was, I was like, where is she getting this from? <laughs> okay. So we can talk about that. Correct me uh, from news articles from like uh, the that Guardian. That explains it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, NBC, um, you know, major um, legacy uh, news outlets. But okay. mm -hmm. from what little I had already talked to you, I thought, I know she's got to be getting this from main sources. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, the... Golly day, I have so much trouble with reporters and editors mm. um, revising stuff to mm. make it fit their narrative. Part up there that you were talking about with the it's green It's still screen. showing right at the edges now. Come down a little bit towards you. Yeah. Okay. Now your glasses get lost. Uh, okay. All right, that's, that's good. Okay. That's well, good. no, that corner is still showing. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't showing when you first came on. I don't know why it keeps yeah, showing. Yeah, I now. know because I had it like this in, in the little holder. And so I didn't have to touch it. I just have it set up. There you go. That's it. Perfect. That's it right there. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Right, we'll, we'll just do that. We'll just do that <laughs> and get started. Okay. All, All of right, us who so are now working from home have to learn so many more skills that we never thought we'd <laughs> need to know. <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's empowering. It is. We help each other out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank Fix you again the for. Yeah, we'll, and just, we'll just take it one question at a time. And okay. um, so anything, this is a conversation. So anything that you want to correct, anything you want to uh, make clear, anything you want to add that I did not, please feel free to do so. And, and I, th I think knowing that the, you got these from public, um, you know, uh, 
main media uh, sources helps me to realize that this is what the public thinks too. Yeah. So what do you think the best source is for your story? Is I it- have no idea. Me? <laughs> uh-huh. I was thinking that. Yeah. But, you know, but, you I know, forget a-, a lot of details uh, because I, it, you know, something happens and then I move on to the next thing. Uh, so yeah. mm. this is good. This is good. Okay. So okay. let's look at let's just start with the uh where we are today so is it true that this person received life plus 419 years yes plus uh quite a bit of uh uh money what do you call that when they have oh they um were you rewarded some money for what happened by the state yeah compensation or something like that damages Mm -hmm. i don't know None of yeah. which we'll ever see. And then I also have a civil lawsuit against him for $12 million. Again, none of which I will ever see. But the main point was to keep him from selling his story for money. And people say, well, no, he wouldn't do that. Nobody cares. Well, Manson did it. Hinckley did it. So uh, yeah. we just did I- it. And, and, you know, it's really interesting that um, when you say, you know, I know that it's for what you're doing is, is it has, it, it's not about the money. I mean, it would be great for people in a capitalistic society to be compensated um, in some way. And because of a, it's a capitalistic society, finances would be good to help pay lawyers, to help go on with your life, that you may need therapy, whatever the case may be. We had, we had all that coverage. Okay. This is purely um, a, one, to send a message that you can't make money off this to anybody. And two, um, to keep him from making money off this. Okay. And that's working out okay? I mean, so far? it's, it's, it's a lawsuit. <laughs> right. Okay. Gotcha. And sometimes it'll sit forever it... un, un, uh, unpaid, I guess is the way to put it because he has mm-hmm. no money. I know he has no money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. You know, a lot of individuals who do certain things, they put up a GoFundMe and all of a sudden they're millionaires and they get all thousands of dollars. Uh, we, but... we had a quarter of a million. Uh, yeah. We didn't set no, up I'm a talking GoFundMe. About... No, I'm talking about the other individual, like the one oh, who, did, oh, oh. who did it. Sometimes they'll set up. Uh, oh, some, uh, there may be one. Be set up with that. Yeah. Well, that's. Yeah. That's I have good. no idea. Right. Right. So you're doing what you all can do and what you all need to do. This is good. Um, so how do you feel about his sen- sentencing? If I can ask that. How do you feel about him getting 419 years? No well, possibility of parole. Um, yeah. You know, I- I realize one, he has mental health issues. I realize two, that he was very young when he did this. I realize he had a horrible childhood in many aspects. However, I know a lot of other people who have the same choice and don't try to murder a ton of people. And the rate at which he drove into that crowd, if you ever watch the videos, he intended to kill more than one person. Um, In court, he pled guilty in the federal case to avoid murder charges. I mean, the death penalty um, for Heather's murder charge, which her father and I did not want in the first place, but the government chose to push the death penalty possibility. Um, And he admitted in court that he um, had intended to harm as many people as possible. Um, The in many ways, although I miss my daughter dreadfully, my, my situation is easier than a lot of people's because I, um, not I, she is not having to have repetitive surgeries, repetitive therapy, PTSD. I mean, there are people who are still going through various procedures. One guy I know has to have his hip bone replaced every five to 10 years. And he was fairly young. Um, people with shattered bones. It, yeah. So he caused a lot of damage. Right. 
And do you think that, you know, knowing about his background, do you, are you under the belief that hurt people hurt people? But at the same time, you said there's a lot of people, there are other people that come from really bad backgrounds and, um, and they don't make the choices that he made. Um, what do you think in general, what do you feel or what have you learned? Do you think is the difference between um, those two types of scenarios? People coming from a, a bad background, not the healthiest, but they don't go on to do bad things. Then other people come from bad backgrounds, not the healthiest, and they go on to do bad things. Do you think that there is a particular difference that will help with the solution of this is what we need to do, this is how we need to fix it, so there is, this never happens again? I don't know. That That's really beyond my area of study and expertise. Um, I don't know what makes the difference. I don't know if it's the age at which trauma begins. And have you spoken to him? No. I saw that he was remorseful. He said he was sorry for what he did. He was not. The, when he said that in court, all of us, every single one of us snorted. He has shown no signs of remorse. He has gone. I have seen... How do I put this without violating confidentiality? I have reason to believe that this was a strategy planned ahead of time. That uh, from the beginning when he gets out of the car and suddenly goes, oh, was someone hurt? Oh, I'm so sorry. And, and please send the ambulance for them and blah, blah, blah. This was all part of a script that was already laid out. Um, Perhaps by him, perhaps by others, uh, as part of a pre-planned strategy, and the um, the whole time he was in court for the state trial and for the federal trial, absolutely no emotion, um, and that could be part of his mental health issue. Um, at no time was there any sort of remorse shown um the only time we heard anything along that line was when he was pleading guilty and that is a very known strategy for trying to get a reduced sentence <laughs> in a trial um but everyone kind of went <laughs> in the courtroom oh. and i'm not that kind of person normally but i was <laughs> just like please don't waste my time yeah, it's really interesting how the humanity of it changes with the, um, the legal strategies, we'll say. Um, very well put. Um, I wanted to um, take this time now to bring in your, 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 your lovely daughter, Heather. And what I really um, appreciated and loved about how you spoke about her and how reading and hearing from you the sound bites that you've had and, and that sort of thing, um, when you when you have spoken for yourself, this fire, this, this, this fight, this courage, um, uh, like to me, you know, Heather was like, like I said, you know, like I wrote to you yesterday, I said, we could have been friends. Like she could, hey, we can hang oh, together. Yeah. I yeah. can see y'all <laughs> getting along just fine. <laughs> and, um, and I was thinking, wow, that would be really, really awesome. One of the ideas she came up with in her memory of um, in the memory of all that she was and the essence of she was uh, that, that she is still is in her spirit um, is to get the area of the park renamed. In no, her no, name. no. Oh, okay. I never, ever wanted a park. I fought tooth and nail to keep people from doing a park or a statue. I never wanted that. I okay. only allowed the street name because they, everybody was insisting they had to do something. It, to me, it would have been better to talk about all of the survivors rather than that. And even her memorial downtown, um, it focuses a lot on her, but it also focuses on civil rights issues in, generals, in general, for which I'm glad. And the Virginia State Police, there's a drawing that people have done for them as well. Uh, they were not killed directly as an impact of the 
events of the day itself, but they did give their lives that day after having worked all day. And their um, video evidence was a key component in um, the case. Of course, there was tons of video evidence, but also they followed him in the helicopter and that helped lead to his arrest. He almost made it to the interstate. Um, he was just a few blocks from the interstate. This is really interesting in that he was convicted of a hate crime and it was a white on white. It, go ahead. No, but I thought that was really interesting because to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that in a way, you know, a lot of times when we see, we hear hate crimes, right? We think of um, one race attacking another race or sexual orientation or gender or something along those lines. This was, it sounds or feels or read like because it was a hate crime that actually hate was put on trial and hate, no matter your skin color, no matter your gender, no matter your sexual orientation, there was hate involved and that's why you were convicted. And I found it so interesting that it was a white on white, but not necessarily, he didn't target Heather, but I'm exactly to have convicted him. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. It, it was considered a racially motivated white on white hate crime. I think it was the first uh, charged in the nation ever, but I, and I'm not positive on that because like I said, I a lot rare. of details. Yeah, no, it's rare. It's um, there was rare. one other one that was charged after that, but convicted before, I believe. Um, but it was racially motivated because he drove into the crowd saying, uh, he said in court, because he didn't like what they were supporting, their Black Lives Matter was what they were supporting. Mm -hmm. And so that's a racially motivated hate crime in his random victim happened to be white so it becomes that odd thing of white on white racially motivated hate crime uh if you look at pictures of the crowd there was probably at least half the crowd was white i know that's that to me um brings hope that to me because no race can do it on their own. As I say in my classrooms, I say in my community presentations, we have to understand that the Underground Railroad was built of many different people, races, ethnicities, religions, um, sexual orientation. You cannot do it alone because that's not truly inclusive. You know, if you want to build a more peaceful, welcoming, inclusive world, a fair, just world, um, it has to include everyone. People have to be treated fairly everywhere, no matter what the law tells us. It as should humans. be a law with, as human beings. That's right, as human beings. It's not that all lives don't matter. All lives do matter, but Black lives are the one being focused on as being treated as if they don't matter. And that's what people don't get. If you, if you say black lives matter, they think, well, you're saying white lives don't matter. No, we're saying black lives matter as much as everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's what the saying is. And I think part of that is this in sociology and psychology, there are theories called the in group and the out group. And what we find on a human level, people want to belong, period. And when you find a majority for instance, when you find these individuals who are used to having some say or feeling that they have some say in everything that there is about America, they're not uh, accustomed to feeling like they're left out or they're marginalized or they're dismissed. And, but, and that could be further from the truth. I mean, and that's not exactly what you're saying. That's not what anybody is saying. We're saying right now, this is what's going on with this group. And so we need to make sure that we come together to make sure that they are heard. Do you see the, the attack on the Capitol? Do you see that in the same way where individuals oh, yeah. feel that they're being left out? And... Um, yeah. Uh, 
that's been an interesting process for me because Kim and I had just sat down to lunch um, and we turned on the TV to watch the um, uh, validation of the votes. And they were just at Arizona starting to debate Arizona. And I said to Kim, something's weird. They're pausing, they're ducking. I said, something's not right. And then of course, all, all hell broke loose. And uh, we watched it for 12 hours and just angry. I think at some point he quit. Actually, I watched it 13 hours. I think he quit after like five hours. Okay. Um, but I was just angry, angry, so angry. I was drained for a couple of days from that depth of emotion. And you remember, I was not at the Unite the Right rally. I only come into the story after she's already dead. And um, so I guess in some ways for me, that was living um through it for the first time but it felt like all too familiar from what i had seen and studied one of the things is that you don't want it to just be the heather story is what i'm getting and that there are a lot of people hurt there are a lot of people that were there um and so and she didn't like statues you said and so she did not want to be um idolized if you will um where she was there for the cause right and so it kind of yeah. feels like you're doing the same thing is that why um you established the foundation okay the story of the foundation this is so weird remember i said that a friend of the family set up the gofundme in fact i didn't even remember felicia um uh the kids had to, the kids god heather was already dead by then my son had to confirm that they were childhood friends. I didn't remember her. Um, and so, you know, when someone set up the GoFundMe, I was quite alarmed. It's like, I don't even know this person. But anyway, um, <laughs> it turned out they the were five, friends. Okay. Yeah. In the five days full of press and the funeral and everything, I wasn't really paying attention to how big it had gotten. So the GoFundMe got up to a quarter of a million dollars, scared the fool out of me. I don't come from money. <laughs> um, and, um, so I stopped it. I said to Felicia, please cut this off. And so she did. But money kept pouring in and, you know, $10 here, $20 there, $50. Um, I don't think anything was bigger than that. I, I could be mistaken, but there was a lot of it coming in. Envelopes and envelopes and envelopes. And it was coming occasionally to my house, but more often to TV stations or general delivery or uh, to the mayor's office in Charlottesville, to um, the Miller Law Group where she had worked, you know, just pouring in. So I went to um, Alfred Wilson, who had been Heather's immediate supervisor, and um, he spoke at the funeral as well, and I said, and his wife as well. And I said, um, and, I need you to help me do something legally responsible with this money so that there's accountability. I said, people can't possibly believe the family needs this much money to deal with, you know, her expenses and everything. So um, we uh, started the Heather Hire Foundation. And uh, meanwhile, the VMA awards had reached out to me and I said, no, I'm not coming. I don't even have clothes to wear. The Ellen <laughs> show also reached out and said, can you come? And I was like, no, I don't have anything to wear. Oh, and we don't have money for travel, you know? So oh. then we took on a PR firm because the press was hounding Heather's high school friends, Heather's brother, my parents, um, just really hounding everybody. So we took on a PR firm to calm all that down and they did a great job um, um and they said oh you're absolutely going to go on the vmas and we'll escort you and you're going to go on the ellen show <laughs> and i said <laughs> okay the ellen show actually gave me clothing i tried um, on a several things and they uh, modified a couple and i wore them on the show and then when it was time to leave they gave me the rest of the clothes and oh, I said, nice. oh, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> That's uh, nice. yeah, it was nice. I still have some of them. 
Uh, that was kind of surreal, but that was how the foundation got launched. And the initial plan was to provide one scholarship for Heather's High School and one scholarship for Charlottesville High School because Heather loved Charlottesville so much. And um, that was as far as we went. And then the Ellen Show had Shutterfly give us $50,000. So we said, oh, maybe we re need to rethink this. So then we began to look at an endowment. And we started building an endowment. Uh, SPLC, who has had me work with them on a number of projects and has Heather's picture in their memorial museum, uh, has a plaque to her. Um, uh, they gave us 50,000 this past year, said it was owed for two years. <laughs> They've been through transitions, I'm sure you are aware. Yeah. And um, so, uh, the endowment's getting bigger. I'm not comfortable with money, as I said before. I don't like all the money going into just an endowment without anything coming out for people's current needs. Uh, we're giving $1,000 scholarships. We're give, we've given 30,000 in scholarships so far, but I feel like money just sitting in a bank earning interest is not really what I wanna do. So I'm looking at options where we can stick to our mission statement and still help meet some community needs. Trying to find ways to continue to build our scholarship program, but also funnel some of that money into the community in ways that still meet our mission statement. And I have learned of some options. So hopefully we can get those running through this by summer. Okay, that sounds great. And you know, that's you're so humble and and so modest, but also I think that you know there's a lot of um, you're not really sure where to place the emotion sometimes, like getting all of this money and just really being down to earth. And you've never been on a show. And I know that when I was going up for my Emmy Awards and it was going to be live television, and I didn't go. I would. I didn't want to go. I was crying. I was like, I have nothing to wear. Like, can I wear <laughs> jeans and and boots? And I got my Stetson hat because I ride horses. And I'm like, can I do that? And you and, probably uh, looked awesome. <laughs> yeah, I did. Thank you. Um, but um, I was. So, it was so wonderful. The women um, in the newsroom who loved me dearly. A lot of the women. Um, they they didn't judge me or anything. They started bringing in these clothes that they thought maybe I could wear and. Um, it just so happened, um, I did, uh, I was Tina Turner at a family reunion and I had, um, I wore this mini skirt, but it was, wasn't too many, but also it reminded me of playing, um, like basketball shorts. So I was able to do that. And then I had the aerosol shoes, you know, the actual commercial that shows women playing basketball in, in these heels, but they're so comfortable like tennis shoes. And, um, and then I had this black ruffle thing whatever that um, a former uh, journalist of mine, Steen Miles, uh, had given me. And it's because of them the night before I decided to go. And because of them that I felt beautiful. Um, I was probably wearing a shirt from one person, a top from one person, skirt from someplace else. And, and, um, and then I had the stockings on, which is really great. But my mom always knew after 30 minutes, I'm going to start scratching because I just don't get it. Um, <laughs> I hate hoes. Oh gosh, I hate them. <laughs> we need to come up with some hoes that are like, feel like lotion or something, just really comfortable. And, um, and I ended up, uh, I had no one to go with and I didn't think it was a big deal, but also being a Christian, a lot of times. You know, I just, I don't like a lot of attention. It's, not, it's really not about me and, and things like that. So I can really relate to what you're, so, you're talking about. But what I've also found out is that how it works for me, and I, I, I'm not sure how it works for you, but when I pray about it, God said, it's not for you. This money is not for you. It's for you to do the things that will make a difference. It's for you, but but also it will help you, you know, help your, for your equipment, help uh, for your, uh, your manager, your agent, things like that, because we do live in a capitalistic society. But when I started thinking about that, and I started looking at it that way, I thought, and it's not just, it's not to just glorify um, me personally, it's to right. glorify the God in me that wants people to 
live better lives and, and to live it all. So I think, you know, as you continue, uh, as your success of this foundation and touching the lives of others continue, um, I hope, and I'm not saying that you're not doing now, I hope that if you ever get um, like, oh my God, I'm getting too much attention. Why am I gonna call me? And I'll <laughs> say, Susan, no, we need to work on this. It's okay. And I, I think you've been doing a fantastic job, but it has to be difficult at times, does it not? Is it, do you find yourself challenged by continuing uh, to talk about this? Like I even felt guilty asking you, like, do I really <laughs> want to ask her like these same questions? How do you feel about that? Um, when it's for work and when it's for a purpose, I'm okay. And if it depresses me, it gets me a little bit later in the evening and I'll be a little bit flattened down. So yesterday I did a presentation as part of the lawyers committee um, for civil rights under the law with the Orlando Police Department. <clears throat> and I am personal friends with the person uh, who is my connection there as well. And we were texting back and forth. And I said, next time I see you face to face, because we haven't seen each other, you know, because of the pandemic, um, I will share with you a video of Heather laughing. So That'd I was watching those this morning. Oh, great God. And I sat and cried oh, man. for probably half an hour. And then I'm yeah. okay because. Um, as the piece I wrote for Fortune magazine says, the grief comes in waves. And when you have lost a loved one, you live in those shallows, but the, the actual waves hit from time to time. But you don't have to chase the wave. You don't have to live in the wave. You'll drown that way. You just get through it. Go ahead and cry if you need to. Go ahead and do whatever you need to, to work through that wave and then let it go. And you're okay. And for me, working, um, working provides me not only an outlet for memorial for her in my own heart, but um, provides me a way to get past the grief. Work gives me purpose. And um, yeah, so yeah. that's how I get through it. Yeah, that's always, yeah, that's a good way of, of looking at it. I love the wave analogy and metaphor. Um, one of the things I posted up on my Facebook is you are not your circumstances. And there are things that happen all of the time. And we can either, it's just like I ride motorcycles. I love sports cars. You cannot. You are so cool. Ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I would love to meet you. And we're just going to have a good time. I can cook too. And uh, I know you can cook, can't you? I, not really. I used not to. Really. Okay. Okay. It's one of the, I'll explain about my different, my life takes 45 degree turns from time to time. Okay. At one point in one of those lives, I could cook. I okay. could make biscuits from scratch. I was a really good cook, although I could never fry chicken. I just gave up and I said, there are too many places that make it cheap. I can go buy it. But um, I did try, but it was a disaster. <laughs> um, same thing for fried fish I don't do well with fried stuff but um yeah I don't really cook anymore okay well you're you know what we don't know what the future is going to bring I think we're going to be great friends and you know what you have to be on my show season with love and we're going to come up because I can cook some fried chicken and I can not only will I fry some good old fish I, I catch my own fish and do you? clams and oysters yeah I've my dad used to take me fishing fish. but he said I talk too much <laughs> Plus, he said I was the worst person he ever met to get a line tangled. And then he took my son fishing and he said, runs in the family, doesn't it? <laughs> it is. Oh, I think that's what my dad, we have six in our family and, um, and we're military. And uh, so where we lived, we lived in Virginia, like I said, the East Coast of Virginia. And uh, my grandparents are on the Eastern Shore of Virginia. And okay. so that's why I learned how to drive on my granddad's lap and then pick up truck on down the country road. And um, it doesn't even have lines on it today, even today, but I love it <laughs> so much. But uh, that's where I learned all that. And then, um, but my dad, you know, with six kids, we would fish all the time. And I think because he was always having to untangle lines that he really, he doesn't fish anymore. He's like, I'm just done. 
um, until I, I was work, a, not pleasure. <laughs> I have talked them into um, fishing a little bit with me when I when I go over to the Eastern Shore. Um, but um, so, yeah, and I'm looking for great things. You know, my prayer, my prayer for you, and my thoughts for you from the very beginning is not only applauding your strength. And I said, this is God given because she's putting purpose into her life uh, to help her uh, cope and grieve. And, and we can decide, like I, like I said, when, you, when you're riding a skateboard or a surfboard or a motorcycle or driving, you cannot see where you're going and stay focused if you look at the rear view mirror or side view mirror. You cannot do it. So sometimes you have to pull over and stop, have your moment, and it's all good. And then put it back in gear and let's go. And I think that, you know, sometimes, and I don't, I'm sure you've thought about this, but I was wondering when I was writing and thinking about the questions and thinking about, because to me, behind every story is a human being. So to me, I'm speaking to you. You're the head of the foundation um, and all of that. And you've been on television, which is, I think it's fabulous. Um, but I, I'm, I'm connecting to the human being who happens to do all of that. And, and, and that's something out there, like you said, with your job. And I think to myself, I was wondering, I said, um, in those moments, have you ever thought about what would Heather be saying right now? How would she, do you feel her like when you're doing some things and you say the right thing and, or you just feel good about what you said or, or. Uh... So let me tell you about me and Heather. <laughs> okay. She was me. bossy. Oh my God. As a child, she was um, defiant a lot. Everything had to be explained. Everything had to be argued about. Um, there was very bossy, alive, and very bossy beyond the grave as well. Uh, in the beginning, we had lots of arguments about jewelry or clothing. She would be like, don't wear that. That's not right. You need to go wear something. I'd be like, dang it, Heather, let me choose my own clothes. No, you need to. And I would find when I would get there that whatever she had said would have been perfect. If, and if I went ahead and did what she said, it worked out better. So okay. I finally quit okay. arguing with her. Um, so you all had a very interesting relationship. And to, now what she... And, and some of that has continued, but so what I wanted to tell you was um, she was constantly in, in my ear and on my shoulder for the first three years. And this past year with me being able to sit still, my brain trauma has healed a lot. Um, with her murder and the events thereafter, a bomb went off in my brain. And this is not uncommon. It's a form of PTSD, as I'm sure you're aware. I had always been an avid knitter and crocheter since I was a little girl. I had been an avid reader. I would go in the library and come out with stacks of books. Suddenly, I was no longer able to concentrate enough to read even a chapter. I could read a news article, might have to read it three or four times to remember anything it said, could not knit or crochet at all, couldn't even pick it up. I tried, couldn't finish a row, couldn't remember how. And, uh, oh, that's okay, I'm just checking. About, um, gosh, I guess it's been a couple of months ago now, maybe a month ago. Time kind of has no flow when you're in a pandemic, you know, you're home or you're not home, that's about it. Um, she came to me in one of my dreams. She looked like a combination of me and her as a small child. I often have dreams of living in a, a commune society, a government run commune society. And um, in this particular one, the government decided she was too old to go to work with me anymore. Mm -hmm. Apparently I had been taking her to work with me every day and um, she was in her car seat and I was on my way to work and they had told me she was going to no longer go to work with me. And I got out of the car and I said, baby, do you want to go to work with me today? And she said, she kissed me and she said, mama, I think I'm okay. 
She said, I think I want to go play with my friends now. And I said, okay. She said, you'll be all right. I said, I know. And so now every time I look at her picture in the living room, I feel a peace that I didn't feel before. I feel a happiness from her. She was very involved and very concerned and very active. And now she feels like she's available. I still hear from other people who say she comes to them from time to time. But um, she doesn't sit on my shoulder like she once did. She's, she says, you got this. You're going to be okay. And um, that was an interesting change for me. Had you experienced anything like that before? No. Um, I knew I could talk to my grandmothers. Um, but um, I thought I was imagining it. And then two or three times, total strangers would walk up to me and say, Heather told me I would be meeting you. One woman walked up and said, um, I'm sorry. I, at that point, everybody was approaching me everywhere I went in public. This was early on. She said, ma'am, I hate to talk to, to bother you. I don't know who you are, but I need to tell you that your daughter wants you to know that it, it is her talking to you. And I said, really? I said, is she alone? She said, no. I said, who is she with? She said, she's with a young black man and she's with your mother's mother. And I said, did my grandmother forgive me for not being religious? And she said, yes, she sees the picture more clearly now and she understands. And that meant so much to me. I don't know where the tears are coming from. It's, a, it's healing. It's healing. And a lot of mothers and daughters are the same, even though they don't realize it till later. Because when you talk about Heather and being bossy, I, 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 I heard it as strong because also, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I was like listening to some of your sound. I remember the first time I saw you and listened to a sound bite. you are not going to let people take it and go this way. You are no. not going to let people say this. So to me, that was kind of like Heather and kind of like you, where I'm like, you're both kind of strong, um, which I think is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So it didn't that take very can... many of us together because mm -hmm. we just assumed we'd always be around. Can I yeah. tell you about the last time I saw her? Sure. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Please do. Yes. <clears throat> we always got together when we got paid because we both got paid twice a month and we would get together for a meal and she would now Heather was born with only one ear. So uh, she had had surgery on the ear, but it really didn't work. So she could get loud in public. <laughs> I'd be like, Shh. So we would talk politics. <laughs> we would talk um, race issues. She would talk about clients. <laughs> I'd be like, that's what I'd be like. Turn it down. <laughs> um, but uh, our last and my husband who has a really bad back he's retired on disability he would go sit in the car because the car seat's more comfortable than the restaurant seat and play video games he was okay with that he knew Heather and I enjoyed time together and he loved her she loved him um, but you know that was our he knew I, I was just going to let her talk so she talked longer than usual that time very animated with her hands always Heather was fantastic one on one, but she was terrified of public speaking. Terrified. That was bad. Um, would never talk on screen. They had a chance to do a commercial for Miller Law Group, and all the girls, I keep calling them girls because they're in their 30s, but you know, to I me, they're that. girls. Yeah. yeah. Um, would, uh, were supposed to say one line. She couldn't do it. None of them did it. They all chickened out, and they're all talkers, which was hilarious to me. It's like you talk, you talk. I don't care if you're talking in front of the president or who, you just talk. Right. But um, so we went out to the car and we hugged and hugged and hugged so many times. And frankly, my family were not huggers until Heather came along. Um, 
she she was the hugger. She got us all hugging. And um, we hugged several times. We kissed each other on the cheek several times. We were laughing at ourselves and we said, it's not like I'll never see you again. Oh, and we never did. That was the last time I saw her. So the next day I got a text message from her at work. And I have screenshots of it lest I ever lose it. And she said, what's your, <clears throat> she said, what's your social security number? I know your birth date. And I gave it to her, which I don't normally give to anyone. <laughs> I would ask them why. But I gave it to her first because I knew she would argue, be upset if I asked her why first. And then said, why do you need it? And she said, well, at work, I'm filling out a, what is a 401k or something? And I want to put you as beneficiary. Mm. By the way, she never did finish filling out the paperwork. Typical <laughs> of my kid. <laughs> Darn. Uh, she never finished filling out her will either. We had to find her pre-will from five years before she died to know what she wanted done with things. But anyway, um, she, she said that. And I said, well, don't die. I'd rather have you than the money. And she said, I'll try not to. And that's the last words I spoke to her besides I love you. How weird is that? The universe was preparing us. I have no regrets in my relationship with her. We had settled childhood issues about her dad and everything. We had had all of our talks and those last two conversations sealed the deal. Thank goodness that the universe, as you said, knows more than we do. Yes. It's a beautiful thing that you can recall hugging and kissing and laughing and and your last words were I love you they were I love you very much don't die I'd rather have you than the money <laughs> you know who says she said, those I'll things try. Yeah. she said I'll try <laughs> and she had no intention of dying she just went to walk that day she was dressed to go work at the bar that afternoon and uh <sighs> how much time in between the last time you saw her and that happened that was August 3rd, 10 days later. No, nine days later, she was killed. We it's didn't talk never... all the time. You know, people say, oh, she was your best friend. No, she wasn't. She <laughs> and I would have laughed at that. Um, why, why would she laugh? What would she say? If you're our, but you all seem like best friends and you, you're funny and you're laughing. You're a lot alike. Why would she laugh at that? Why would you all laugh like best friend? Because it's like, no, she isn't. Like funny, like. Because when I see mother daughter best friends, they talk every day. They do, we'd go two or three weeks without saying a word, but we'd be okay about it, you know? Yeah. Um, I didn't ask who she was sleeping with. Mm -hmm. I knew who she was sleeping with because other people told me, but I never asked. <laughs> and, um, you know, she didn't confide in me a lot of things. Um, and that's okay. She was 32, she was an adult. I didn't expect to know everything about her lives. If anything, my kids both told me way more than I wanted to know about their relationship sometimes. <laughs> it's like, you're grown. Don't tell me. I don't want to know. And, you know, like I said, I lived with, with Kim before we got married. I wasn't opposed to whatever they chose to do. I, I loved them because they were my kids. She always thought I loved her brother more. He always thought I loved her more. <laughs> I love both well, of them. And that's, you know, I, I think that, um, and so that's so hilarious. That's so great. And I think that's these stories that you're telling me, it's like, though, that to me is life. Those are things that, uh, you know, um, I'll, I'll get back to that because we're, we're about to close up because I, I just have one more question basically, but, and I can ask you questions about uh, pictures, but um, people, what to me, it's because of that connection that people saw and felt that made you all best friends. Not the fact that you talked every day, but just the changes and transformation that you all had gone through together, you know, working on uh, the relationship from what it was and what it became. Um, yeah. 
And even when you tell the story, <laughs> when she she talks a little loud, and then she's talking about clients in public. Or it's like, God, like, Heather, <laughs> come on, you're a paralegal. You can't do that. <laughs> but she couldn't help it because she couldn't hear but out of one ear and everything. So it wasn't her fault. No. But it's really, to me, those are those those are the precious memories. And um, that I think that a lot of people, I think, you know, to me, that shows a human side of her. And that shows the human side of you and the relationship that that still goes on and that still is. Um, so that's that's what I love about it. And and so um, so let me ask you this. Um, this is my last question, and then I'm going to close this out a little bit. Um, well, wait a minute. Let me tell you what okay. I told the, the Orlando Police Department yesterday. They asked the question was put to me: What would you like us to know about Heather? I said she was wild and woolly. She was feisty. She wore her clothes way too tight. She wore her um, shirts a little lower cut than I would have liked, but I loved her for who she was. She smoked Newports. She drank cheap whiskey with diet soda, and I believe they're called skinny bitches. Um, The drink is, and um, that was okay because that's who she was. I loved her. That is so beautiful. I'm, I'm going to tell you, she sounds like my type of gal. I'm telling I, I you. can see that y'all would have gotten along. <laughs> she would have been intimidated by you, though. She had no self-confidence whatsoever. Oh, no. She, you know what? Let me tell you, um, Susan, that we would have worked on that, too, because I'm like, I don't have time for that low self-esteem. So come on, girlfriend. We're going to go I think you would have and... been wonderful for her. <laughs> oh, press our heart. Like, thank you so much. That means so much to me. And I think she would have been wonderful for me because she seems like a hoot. Like she was just oh, she doing was. her own thing. <laughs> she was a hoot. Oh, she I was. Love I love that. I love that. I love that. I love that. Um, well, this is God is so good because my question was, what do you want people to know about Heather? <laughs> that was <laughs> Heather. Are you here, Heather? <laughs> so like, let me tell you. I tell if people you look at that list I have down there. What do you want? the people to know about Heather and what do you want the world to know, but go ahead. Yeah. I, I, I have a full lecture, which I will give you in one sentence. Okay. Um, Heather is important as an example of what one person can do just by standing up. That's all she did. She took some time from her morning. Heather was, she had sleep issues. And so for her to even be up that early in the day and she hated walking in the heat she hated being hot and it was a hot August day and she's wearing black out there. <laughs> so for her to do that tells you how much this meant to her. Right. Um, but Heather is an example of what one person can do just by doing a small action. And you don't know what the results of that action will be. That's why she's important. Why she's not important is because she was a random murder. She was not assassinated. She was not a hero in the sense of she was someone who did something that other people were not also doing. We only know about her because she was white and killed in a racially motivated hate crime. Had she been black, had she been Asian, had she been gay, had she been anything but cisgender white, We probably wouldn't even know about her. And that's not fair. That's part of what's wrong with society is that we're so focused on people who only look like ourselves as white society that we don't pay attention to all the other deaths from people who are not white. It's not fair that it took a white girl dying for people to pay attention But unfortunately, as humans, we seem to require human sacrifice of some kind before we get excited about something. So I was, of course, horrified when Ahmaud Aubrey died and Breonna Taylor died and when George Floyd died. But I was at least glad to see America got excited for half a minute. Are they still excited? Statistics say probably not, but we've got work to do. We've got systems to change, but that's what I want you to take away from Heather is that she was important as an example of what one person can do with a simple act. She's not important in the sense that she was an ordinary person doing an ordinary simple thing. 
And we're all capable of that. We're just called to stand up at the right time. When that moment comes, take the stance. Don't say, oh, somebody should do something. Do it. If you see it, do it. I'm glad that you, that was my other question. Uh, what do you want the world to know? So you did that superbly. <laughs> um, and so let me, let me say this. Let me say this. this, this. And I, because I want to connect with what you had said. Um, just give me one moment. Okay. So what I want to say is that Heather's life and the legacy that you carry on in the name of your daughter, your awesome whiskey drinking like me, daughter, I love her. Um, that, as you said, it shows that one person can make a difference. And one person that, you know, we think is something small, a small gesture can move mountains. A small gesture can move people. A lot of times, if we knew everything like, oh my goodness, if I go out here and I do this and then that happens and, and you know, a lot of times we wouldn't, we wouldn't do it. We, we don't want to do it. We don't, we don't need to do it. And that could be on both sides of it. Like you can go out and something great can happen. You can go out and something not so great can happen. You never know how your life is going to be called. And just the fact that to me, as you said, it wasn't just Heather there. If we look at the video, we saw diversity. We saw people, all types of people, saying that we do not want to be a part of this hate anymore. And we are going to stop it. Um, and we're going to march and protest against it because our voices will not be silenced. Our our, our our love of inclusion and fairness will not be silenced. And I think that that you know that is the legacy and the memory and the honor that will live past Heather, that will live past you, that will live past me because it is a story. Once you tell a story, you cannot untell it. And so in 50 years, someone will tell this story. Someone will hear this story. Someone will find your sound bite. Someone will say, this is what I want people to remember about my daughter. And to know that the effects of that, the positive effects, um, will continue and will live on and on. Well, all. thank you. Brings me joy. Brings me joy. I spoke to a college freshman class yesterday about uh, the title of the class is Collective Memory. So the uh, professor is a friend of mine on Facebook and invited me to speak. And one of the comments from the student came back that they really appreciated me telling the story that I made it seem relevant to today. <laughs> Now, for me, that was just a blip ago. But I thought about it. The person who wrote that would have only been 13 or 14, maybe 15 when Heather was killed. So, of course, that seems like ancient history to them. And already we have a new generation of leaders come that this will be a past uh, part of collective memory. However, the work that has come as a result of that is ongoing. And um, part of the uh, other people who were there were Matthew Shepard's parents, and also uh, uh, the story of uh, Khalid Jabara's murder, which was exactly a year before Heather's. All of those are leading to legislation, which will impact future generations. And um, 
hopefully we with the lawyers committee can get <laughs> that going again it, it, so yeah the story itself will probably be forgotten but hopefully we're putting in place legacies that will make a difference on down the road absolutely and it's about human beings as we said earlier it's about human beings making a decision about them their lives yeah it's yeah. every human being making a, a decision and what i you know heather was white yes and so heather did not have to be there heather did not have to even feel anything about black lives matter she did it because on a human level it was the humane thing to do it was the just it, it, it was it worked it was for her to say right is right I understand what they're saying. I'm going to get out there and I'm going to do it. And I think on that level, when we get to the point where, where we're human beings and we're of the human race, which I think is the ultimate goal for all of us, um, that, and, and you know what, um, um, Susan, we have to do whatever we can do to take these steps to get there. And while the legislation is going on and things will happen, change can happen right now. People can do positive things right now in their lives today while legislation is still going on, but I'm going to pray with you that uh, we continue to um, get laws passed that will protect every person um, so that we can get past this point of disagreement that has to end in death. It is absolutely atrocious. And I think that, you know, um, it is wonderful what you're doing. I want to thank you so, so, so very much um, for having the, um, <laughs> you call it bossy with Heather, I'll say the strength and the courage and the fortitude and also the calling on your life, the calling on your life from a higher power to do the great work that you're doing, to continue to speak up um, about um, just all of us getting along and, and living to see a better day. And um, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, you know, when I was prepared to be a public speaker, age three, what do you mean? We didn't have microphones in the church for the Christmas program. And so uh -huh. my dad would have me practice my part, speaking loudly and clearly <laughs> behind a closed bedroom door so he could hear me at the other end of the house at age three, oh my, my one God. little line for the Christmas play. I look back now, Janice, God. I see so many ways God prepared me for this. Praise God. My total lack of being in awe of celebrity has served me well um i've met so many and i don't care they're people <laughs> you yeah. know politicians i'm not in awe i will say what i need to say i will respect but i will say what i need to say because that's just who i am and that that has been molded in me God did not make James Fields put his foot on that gas pedal and accelerate into the crowd. He gave him free will to choose to put it in reverse and leave the way he managed to leave at the time. But he also gave him free will to put his foot on the gas pedal and he had everything in place in case he made that choice. And on that note, I'm out of time and you are too. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. And, and I, I'm so thank you so much for, 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 for ending it on that note. And I do believe that uh, God makes no mistakes. At three years old, God already knew what you were going to have to do on the Ellen DeGeneres show, on the VMAs, on all of that. Your dad knew and said, honey, this is what I want you to do. And you're doing it brilliantly. And I want to thank, thank you. you so much. God bless you. I love you. And you take great care. And uh, I will talk to you again soon. <laughs>